Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So now that we've gone over the hand rules, the first hand rule, which talks about the magnetic field created by a wire, and the third hand rule, I know we skipped the second, that talks about the magnetic force acting on a moving charge or a wire, okay, let's talk a little bit more about how we actually calculate that magnetic force that's acting on a wire or charge, okay. We have two formulas. We have one for wires and one for charges. The one for wires is the magnetic force is equal to the magnetic field times the current times the length of wire within the magnetic field itself. So this is the magnetic force. This is the magnetic field, the unit of which is in Teslas, named after Tesla, Nikolai Tesla, of course, so T. I is the current, and L is the length of wire within, okay? Keep in mind, of course, that this is an external magnetic field. This is not the magnetic field created by the wire. The wire itself is acting as a magnet, but that's a different formula. If we modify this formula for a moving particle, it looks like this. The magnetic force on a mag moving particle would be the charge times the speed of the particle that's moving times the magnetic field. So over here, this would be the charge, velocity, and the external magnetic field. Okay. Keep in mind, of course, that I actually left out one part of the formula over here. But I just want you guys to understand it without having me to write it in. And that's actually a sine theta at the end of each formula. You see, you have to understand that you feel the, these charges or wires feel the maximum force when everything is perpendicular to each other. Okay? So it's always felt a maximum at 90 degrees. There's absolutely no force whatsoever if these happen to, if the charge happens to be moving parallel to the direction of the magnetic field. So if there was a magnetic field over here, and you had an electron that's traveling to the right, parallel to the magnetic field, it would feel zero force. It's only if the electron is moving perpendicular to the magnetic field that it actually feels the force itself. So if we just do a couple practice questions now over here. We have a wire 150 meters, meters long is held at a right angle to a uniform magnetic field, which has a strength of 5 times 10 to the negative Tesla. So V is equal to 5 times 10 to the negative Tesla. The length of the wire is 150 meters. And the current within the wire is 400 amps. So FB was simply equal to BIL. As the rate sine 90, of course, is 1. So in this case over here, once I plug in all my numbers, I can find that the magnetic force is equal to 2.3 newtons. Okay? So it's pretty straightforward to use. It gets to be a little bit trickier when we use it in conjunction with the hand rule over here. The question says that we have a proton, so that means the charge of a proton is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, has a velocity of 1.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. To the right, projected into a magnetic field, which has a flux density, we'll talk more about the words flux density later, three Teslas directed out of the page. What is the magnetic of what is the magnitude of the magnetic force? Fv is equal to QVB. So when I plug all these numbers in, I get a force of 7.2 times 10 to the negative 14 newtons. If I wanted to find out which way it's going to go, I would now have to use my hand rule. It is a proton, so I use my right hand. And the magnetic field is coming out of the page. So that means over here, my thumb should be pointing to the right. My hand is going to be rotated so that way the magnetic field is pointing out of the page. And now we can see that my palm is facing down. So that means that this proton is going to curve downward. 
In fact, if I wanted to solve for the radius of curvature, assuming that this was a larger magnetic field and it actually traveled in a complete circle, I can always set my value for force equal to mv squared over r. Okay, And radius, of course, would then equal to mv squared, so the mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms times v squared, 1.5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared, divided by 7.2 times 10 to the negative 14 newtons. So overall, my radius would equal to 5.22 times 10 to the negative 4 meters. Okay. In number seven, an electron beam is projected into a magnetic field. If the speed is doubled and the magnetic field strength is halved, what happens to the force? This is just a multiplier question. The speed was doubled, the magnetic field was halved. Overall, there would be no change. Number eight is a trickier question because they give us the radius already. They're asking us to solve for the magnetic field strength. So in this case, again, we know that FB or QVB is acting as the centripetal force. And notice that there's a velocity on each side. So that means that this velocity over here, I can cross out the square and so cross out that V. So B would equal to mv over qr when it's been manipulated. So I end up with 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms times 2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times the radius of 0 0.1 meters. And I end up with magnetic field strength of 20.88 tesla. What is the path of a charged particle if its velocity is not perpendicular to the magnetic field? Well, if it's parallel, of course, there's no force. But understand that if it's not perfectly perpendicular, if it's not perfectly parallel, there's still going to be a magnetic force. In fact, it ends up looking a little bit like this, where the, the charge will actually continue to spiral around the magnetic field. Because according to our hand rule, we're still going to feel a force of some sort, but it's going to spiral and it's going to have another motion as, as well. We could take a look in this mathematical example over here. With this velocity, you can see it's not perfectly perpendicular. It has an X component and a Y component. The X component is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So if I wanted to solve for uh, my total magnetic force, I would do FB is equal to QV on the x-axis, B, so equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times the velocity on the x-axis, so that would be 4 times 10 to the 7th meters per second, times sine of 40, in this case, times magnetic field of 1.2 teslas, and I see that my total magnetic force would equal to 4.94 times 10 to the negative 12 newtons. Okay. But that means that Right now, if I were to use my hand rule, okay, because it's an electron, I use my left hand, the electron's going to the left, but the magnetic field is pointing straight down. That means my magnetic force is coming out of the page, which again means 
So that literally means that this electron is going to spiral in and out of the page because of the magnetic field. But there's a downward component also. So that means, and that downward component doesn't disappear. So that means that as it's spiraling in and out of the page, it's literally spiraling downward along the magnetic field line. Okay, so literally be going down the magnetic field line, which is what we saw in this example over here. So we, if you were to use our hand rule over here, we would see that the, in this case over here, the chart is going left at that exact point, close enough. The magnetic field is going up, okay? So if I use my hand rule, thumb points left, my right hand thumb points left, my, fing my fingertips point up, I can see that my palm is going into the page. So if I continue this, you can see that literally the electron gets pushed into the page, I mean the proton gets pushed into the page, it gets pushed into the page, but there's an upward component as well, so it just keeps on traveling along. Okay, and the fact is, we could, this is actually why the Earth is able to uh, protect us from solar particles. You have all these charged particles that strike the Earth's atmosphere every day, and they're dangerous to us. But because we have a magnetic field, as soon as those charged particles hit the magnetic field, they start to spiral, and they follow along the magnetic field lines. And that's why when you go towards the North Pole, you can see the aurora borealis. The aurora borealis is actually after there's been a solar storm, those charged particles all striking the Earth. And when they strike the Earth's atmosphere, they form certain colors. And that's why all the colors are up north or actually up south as well. So the aurora borealis exists at both the South Pole and the North Pole locations.